Thank the law you're here. That madman was out of control. You were right to put him down. He was too far gone to be of any use to us. And what about you? You aren't hurt, I hope. I'm not hurt. Well, except for my pride. I can't believe that lunatic got the better of me. You've put down the worst riot in our history. Rid the colony of a dangerous madman and saved my life. The board owes you a tremendous debt. We don't have a moment to lose. We're gonna have to work together to save Halcyon, because the situation is far worse than you imagined. We've lost all contact with Earth. It's been three, two years ago the- They haven't exactly- So we've- We must find- We're alone, Captain. That's all- It's time we carried out the program. I trust I can count on your support, Captain. The OSI teaches that everything in the universe happens according to the grand plan. But the stranger that arrived in Halcyon was an unplanned variable. From the moment he landed in Emerald Vale, his actions altered the course of history. The riots in Tartarus ended in a total victory for the board. Without any significant threats to challenge their power, the board asserted their control over the colony. The lifetime employment program began immediately, and the people of Halcyon did exactly what they were expected to do. They obeyed. Sophia Akande converted the labyrinth from a prison to a processing center. She jettisoned the original colonists out of the home and transformed the ship into a massive storage facility. One by one, the workers of Halcyon surrendered themselves to the program. They arrived with their families and their friends, their colleagues and their neighbors. And then, one by one, they marched into their stasis chambers. As the workers of Halcyon slept in their hibernation chambers, their settlements became ghost towns, left behind by the board to be reclaimed by nature. Only Byzantium remained, a shining beacon of civilization in an otherwise abandoned colony. The people of Byzantium spent the rest of their days gorging themselves on their stockpile of resources. As for the workers of Halcyon, they never felt the effects of the collapse. They never felt anything at all. As the board began to enact the lifetime employment program, Sanjar and Zora brought another option to the townships of Terra II. Many workers joined MSI, bolstering Sanjar's ranks and giving Zora more forces to work with. Though none of Sanjar's policies spread to Byzantium, many smaller townships that might otherwise have been shuttered thrived under his and Zora's combined leadership. Bolstered by her status as savior of humanity, Lilia Hagen ushered Sublight Salvage to a new golden age. Her company grew bolder and more transparent over time, muddying the line between lawful and criminal for the entire colony. The Sublight family would thrive for years to come. Over the years, the ruins of Edgewater caused irreversible environmental damage to the landscape of Emerald Vale, owing largely to the presence of toxic compounds in the town's building materials. As for Edgewater's former workers, their remains provided a source of nourishment for the region's fauna, leading to an explosion in the Sprat population. While the groundbreaker remained mechanically stable, the changing times forced Junlei Tennyson to make some difficult calls on behalf of her community. The work of maintaining independence was an uphill climb, and she found herself caving to bad faith compromises with the board. Time will tell if the groundbreaker can endure. As smaller settlements were swallowed up and their workers drafted into the lifetime employment program, Byzantium continued to thrive. While its citizens lived in decadence and extravagance, 
a small cadre of scientists worked to solve the nutrition crisis that threatened Halcyon. No one else much noticed the townships that disappeared from the map or the luxuries that slowly lost their luster year by year. Even the Gorgon asteroid, though a distant enigma to most of Halcyon, felt the aftershocks of your actions. The abandoned research facility on Gorgon remained a place of chaos, a draw for smugglers looking for salvage and ill-fated freelancers hoping for a payday. Minnie Ambrose never got what she wanted from the Gorgon asteroid. The secrets of the old Spacer's Choice project were forever outside of her reach. In time, she abandoned the family estate, determined to seek her fortunes elsewhere in the colony. In spite of everything, the Gorgon asteroid remained a sobering reminder of the potential for progress and disaster in humanity's most ambitious efforts. Your influence shifted Ellie's perspective. She finally admitted, albeit grudgingly, that she just might need other people. Sometimes. With a steady income from the life insurance payouts, she was finally able to afford a ship of her own. She hired a small crew and flew supply missions to communities on the fringe. Some of them were even legal. As the board reasserted control over Halcyon, Felix came to realize that his life as an upstart rebel had come to an end. The board's victory crushed any hope for a grand revolution across Halcyon. And so Felix, once again, found himself without a purpose in life. And so, disillusioned with his former boss and with nowhere left to go, Felix left his crew without saying goodbye. He was never heard from again. As a reward for his part in her courageous rescue, the adjutant invited the vicar known as Max to become one of the leaders of the Order of Scientific Inquiry. But Max had no interest in serving any organization, let alone the OSI, which he knew would never tolerate his heretical theories. Instead, he attempted to minister to the people of Byzantium. They rejected his ideas, being far too satisfied with their own material comforts. Disillusioned, Max gave up and left the city. He was never heard from again. Once the matter with the Hope colonists was resolved, Junle bashfully asked Parvati if she'd like to join her permanently on the Groundbreaker, and Parvati enthusiastically, if somewhat awkwardly, agreed. As the board began to roll out their lifetime employment program, Parvati was increasingly plagued by dreams of freezing to death and rarely left their shared quarters. Stymied by dwindling resources, Junlei struggled to keep the groundbreaker afloat. Their relationship couldn't survive the strain. Parvati moved into crew quarters and found work servicing water pumps in hydroponics. Nioka returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Charon Group, a mercenary outfit of ragtag survivalists and wilderness experts. Anyone in need of a guide, or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories, could find her camping on the trail or clearing an infestation. The SAM unit that accompanied you spread awareness of the product line's superior sanitation and maintenance capabilities across what was left of the colony. This led to a boost in SAM unit sales. Did you know that SAM units are the longest-lasting, toughest-acting cleaning solution in Halcyon? Minister Clark was released from house arrest, and his contact with you gave him a sense of renewed purpose and vigor. Once it became clear that no help would be coming from Earth, he threw his considerable efforts and talents into helping Halcyon manage the crisis before it. Adjutant Sophia Akande was instrumental in executing the Lifetime Employment Program. While the rest of Byzantium celebrated, Sophia returned to work by partnering with you. The two of you worked hard to ensure the lifetime employment program ran smoothly. With Halcyon's workers suspended in a state of hibernation, starvation and chaos are problems of the past. The lifetime employment program succeeded in its goals, but that success came at a price. 
The halcyon of today is nothing at all like the colony of yesteryear. Power remains concentrated in Byzantium, but all the colony's resources serve the lifestyle of the elite, thereby transforming Halcyon into one of the smallest and most exclusive colonies in the system. And what about you, the unplanned variable in the history of Halcyon? After the riots on Tartarus came to an end, you threw in your support with Sophia Akande. While Akande administered the board herself, you oversaw the lifetime employment program, stamping out corruption and negligence. Under your leadership, the program ran smoothly. Halcyon's workers were treated with a modicum of dignity. Your involvement kept the board honest and allowed the board scientists to work without the meddling of bureaucracy. No one knows what's happened to Earth, and no one knows what the future has in store for Halcyon. All we know for certain is this, the name of the unreliable and that of its intrepid captain will remain the subject of countless stories for years to come. You don't know how glad I am to see you. And you, you lunatic, you broke it. I'm all... You, you and I are going to have to work harder than ever. So we've got to make do on our own. You're... We're in serious trouble, my... We're going to need a leader, and I can't imagine a better person for the job than you. What do you say, old friend? Will you help us? The chairman. The OSI teaches that everything in the universe happens according to the grand plan. But the stranger that arrived in Halcyon was an unplanned variable. From the moment he landed in Emerald Vale, his actions altered the course of history. The events on Tartarus brought about the end of the board's authority. But the board's mistakes would haunt the colony for decades to come. The damage they left behind would require the work of a generation to repair. Dr. Phineas Wells began reviving a handful of the Hope's colonists, engineers, scientists, technicians, and intellectuals. They were among the brightest minds the Earth had ever sent out into the stars. The Hope's scientists and engineers woke up in a colony descending headlong into total collapse. With no way to return to Earth, they had no choice but to band together and devote themselves to the cause of saving Halcyon. The people of Halcyon were nothing if not hardy. In the absence of the board's authority, many of the colony's settlements banded together with a single purpose in mind, survival. Life was especially hard in the years to come. Some towns dissolved by attrition and starvation, but most of them found a way to carry on. In the years to come, Halcyon was forced to reckon with its newfound freedom. The board was gone, and for better or worse, the colony was responsible for its own destiny. Between MSI's worker-centric policies and the iconoclast's manpower, Sanjar and Zora were able to rally many of the Terra 2 townships to their cause. MSI's workforce swelled, and the iconoclasts enjoyed a significant surge in their ranks. The board was too distracted by infighting and internal politics to stop MSI from becoming a powerful corporation and a refuge for townships that might have fallen through the cracks. Bolstered by her status as savior of humanity, Lilia Hagen ushered Sublight Salvage to a new golden age. Her company grew bolder and more transparent over time, muddying the line between lawful and criminal for the entire colony. The Sublight family would thrive for years to come. Over the years, the ruins of Edgewater caused irreversible environmental damage to the landscape of Emerald Vale, 
owing largely to the presence of toxic compounds in the town's building materials. As for Edgewater's former workers, their remains provided a source of nourishment for the region's fauna, leading to an explosion in the Spratt population. Under the leadership of Junlei Tennyson, the groundbreaker held firm against corporate influence. The ship's mechanical stability gave Junlei the time to educate a promising generation of engineers schooled in her family's traditions. The future of the groundbreaker looks promising. The rediscovery of the hope and the abandonment of the lifetime employment program forced Byzantium to come to terms with some uncomfortable realities about the state of Halcyon. While Byzantines were reluctant to surrender the luxuries they'd grown accustomed to, the board's diminished authority gave them little choice in the matter. Nearly everyone had to learn to make do with less. Some even had to get jobs. It was a dark time indeed. Even the Gorgon asteroid, though a distant enigma to most of Halcyon, felt the aftershocks of your actions. Olivia and Minnie Ambrose worked together to cure the marauders Adrena Time had created. Through their partnership as scientist and administrator, they discovered the harmony that had eluded them as mother and daughter. And through years of patience and effort, they discovered a means to wean Halcyon from the scourge of Adrena Time. Their work eventually allowed Wells and his scientists to treat many of Halcyon's marauders. As their addiction waned, the colonists who had lived for so long under the thrall of Adrena Time returned to their communities and loved ones and joined in the effort to save Halcyon. In spite of everything, the Gorgon asteroid remained a sobering reminder of the potential for progress and disaster in humanity's most ambitious efforts. The Rizzo's company in Halcyon dissolved after the collapse of the board. Needless to say, the launch of Spectrum Brown was indefinitely delayed. A stockpile of Spectrum Brown remains buried deep beneath the ruins of the old distillery, abandoned to time and attrition. Ruth Bellamy never forgot the words you said to her. She coped with Belinda's death by committing to live in a way that would make her sister proud. When the remnants of the colony banded together, Ruth Bellamy was there to help. She devoted her remaining years and resources to saving the colony. Years later, when the worst of the crisis had passed, Aetherways returned to Halcyon's culture. An aging Ruth Bellamy tried her hand at directing. Her first Aetherwave drama was dedicated to the memory of Belinda Bellamy and to her old friend, Captain of the Unreliable. The dissolution of the board did not mean the dissolution of the ambitions of Cedric Kincannon, the charismatic leader of Sublight Underground. Cedric offered Slug's transportation services to the newly thawed colonists and set to work ferrying resources and food wherever they were most needed. For better or worse, Slug headgear became fashionable in the following years. As the board began to disintegrate, Spencer Woolrich found himself at a crossroads. Cling to what little stardom remained to him, or help usher Halcyon into its new future. To the surprise of many, perhaps himself most of all, Spencer chose the latter option. Having learned a variety of different skills and the many different roles played throughout his lengthy career, Spencer founded a radio serial dedicated to staying alive despite the odds. His subjects included how to survive violent encounters with only grazing wounds, dispense pithy one-liners for tense scenarios, and, of course, how to look good doing both. After a brief attempt at dating Helen as one person rather than two, which both Bertie and Helen found too strange, Bertie struck out on his own 
to try his hand at raising woolly cows. Many of his former ranger's teammates soon followed. Accompanied by the woolly cow, the team had originally plied with alcohol. The dairy farm thrived under Bertie's leadership and care. The dairy rangers privately believed that the woolly cow softened Bertie's temper considerably. Although the only one brave enough to say this to his face was promptly headbutted. Due to the board's dissolution, many of the Prophet's old customers no longer found quite the same value in productivity seminars that they once had. With her business drying up, the Prophet chose to take her followers down a new path. Months later, salvagers on Eridanos found clues leading them to a seemingly abandoned bunker out in the wilderness. Inside, they discovered horribly mangled corpses sacrificed to a blood-scrawled portrait of a sprat-headed deity. The Prophet was not among the bodies. Your influence shifted Ellie's perspective. She finally admitted, albeit grudgingly, that she just might need other people. Sometimes. With a steady income from the life insurance payouts, she was finally able to afford a ship of her own. She hired a small crew and flew supply missions to communities on the fringe. Some of them were even legal. Life in Halcyon was sobering for Felix Melstone. The grand revolution he dreamed of never came. There was no great awakening for the colony, no celebrations in the streets. There was only the hard, desperate work of trying to repair a broken colony. Felix never had a head for numbers, but if there was labor to be done, he was there to help. Eventually, Felix realized that the work of a revolution was done with two hands. As much as he enjoyed his adventures aboard the Unreliable, the vicar known as Max eventually decided that it was time to move on, to live out the life he had sought so long to create. He knew there were many in the colony who carried burdens much worse than the ones he had struggled with, and he devoted himself to easing their suffering wherever he could. He only ever took up arms again to defend the defenseless. Unshackled from a lifetime of striving and fighting the universe and himself, Vicar Maximilian de Soto was finally at peace. Once the matter with the Hope colonists was resolved, June Lay bashfully asked Parvati if she'd like to join her permanently on the Groundbreaker, and Parvati enthusiastically, if somewhat awkwardly, agreed. The stories of her adventures spread across the colony, and Parvati soon found herself the center of attention. Having served as the engineer of a renowned spacecraft, tramp freighters and wildcat miners sought her out by name. And in no time, she was a fixture in the Groundbreaker's mechanical ecosystem. She and Jun Lei were never far apart. Neogia returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Terra Group, a mercenary outfit of the Ragtag Revivalists and the Wilderness Experts. Anyone in need of a guide, or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories, could find her camping on a trail, or clearing an infestation. The Sam unit that accompanied you spread awareness of the product line's superior sanitation and maintenance capabilities across what was left of the colony. This led to a boost in Sam unit sales. Did you know that SAM units are the longest-lasting, toughest-acting cleaning solution in Halcyon? Minister Clark was released from house arrest, and his contact with you gave him a sense of renewed purpose and vigor. Once it became clear that no help would be coming from Earth, he threw his considerable efforts and talents into helping Halcyon manage the crisis before it. It was widely suspected that Sophia Akande was the true power behind Chairman Rockwell. However, after the riots on Tartarus, she was never again seen in the colony. Various theories circulated as to her fate. Some believed she boarded an interstellar ship capable of journeying to a distant colony. Others believed she died trying to escape Tartarus. 
Some few suggest she fled to Monarch, where she continued to live among a small band of loyalists. There is another theory, which suggests that Sophia's encounter with you changed her, and she deliberately retreated from public view, but continued supporting the colony in secret. When Dr. Wells began reviving the Hope's colonists, he found himself with a sudden windfall of additional supplies and resources, courtesy of an anonymous donor. If Wells knew who his supplier was, he never told a soul. Chairman Rockwell served as the public face for the changes in Halcyon to come. Whenever you needed strings pulled or a voice to sell a policy change, Rockwell was only too happy to oblige. As for Dr. Phineas Wells, he spent his remaining years in his orbital lab. He eventually came to terms with his own past and was able to forgive the mistakes of his younger self by devoting his remaining years to serving the colony. Dr. Wells was able to revive many more scientists and engineers than he first expected, thanks to the additional batch of chemicals you stole from the ministry. Wells never forgot about the human lives that were lost in acquiring these chemicals. In the end, Dr. Wells was able to save every scientist and engineer aboard the Hope. Over the next decade, nearly all of the Hope's remaining colonists were successfully revived. Halcyon saw a period of rapid technological and scientific advancement. Breakthroughs in dietary supplements saved the colony from starvation. Geoengineering projects and social reforms began to change the structure and character of the colony. Dr. Wells laid the groundwork for the project to save the colony, but he would never live to see the fruits of his labor. He passed away a few years later. His work was carried on by the scientists and engineers he revived. Today, Halcyon has stabilized. The people of the colony work hard to adapt to their new circumstances. Nearby colonies send aid and supplies. Life will never be easy in Halcyon. But for the first time in its history, there exists a sense of real, genuine hope about the future. And what about you, the unplanned variable in the history of Halcyon? You brought an end to the chaos on Tartarus and made Chairman Rockwell your own puppet, a role he was all too eager to play. The colony never realized you were the true power behind the new administration. By acting vicariously through agents and third parties, you controlled Halcyon from the shadows. As a result, Halcyon survived the turbulent years that were to follow. No one knows what's happened to Earth, and no one knows what the future has in store for Halcyon. All we know for certain is this. The name of the unreliable and that of its intrepid captain will remain the subject of countless stories for years to come.